It's Monday. It's April 25th. And the word of the day is honorific abilitudinitatibus, which means the state of being able to achieve honors. Used in the sentence, within Shakespeare's entire body of work, honorific abilitudinitatibus only appears once and is therefore a hapax legomenon. And if you knew that, you are honorific abilitudinitatibus. There you go. Also very useful if you need a rhyme for soporific civilian dude with a platypus. And I do, often. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm No Illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, a Trump appointee sends masks to jails for their crimes against humanity. Tucker Carlson's lie to his wife about that being suntan lotion he was slathering his balls with gets out of hand. <laughs> That does happen. And InfoWars goes from morally bankrupt to the other one, too. <laughs> <laughs> but first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, No Illusions, and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, Toronto trip coming up soon. You ready to... Stock up on syrup and insulin together? <laughs> to be fair, if I didn't buy so much syrup, I wouldn't need the insulin, so. True. I, so, look, it's a whole country full of legal weed, Heath. I think their syrup is safe from me. Okay. Mm-hmm. In our lead story tonight, we learned last week that there just might be a downside to granting lifetime judicial appointments to inept morons whose only qualification is partisanship. And we learned that when a Trump-appointed federal judge in Florida struck down the CDC's transportation mask mandate on grounds so flimsy they made cheesecloth look like chain mail. Judge Catherine Kimball Mizell, who has been described by the American Bar Association as, quote, not qualified to be a judge, Tight. end quote. Interesting. <laughs> issued her injunction last Monday claiming the CDC overstepped their statutory authority, failed to justify their decision, and didn't follow proper rulemaking procedures. And while this very ruling cast her as something of an expert in overstepping authority, unjustified decisions, and improper rulemaking <laughs> procedures, one thing she's not an expert in, apparently, is the goddamn law, because she gets virtually every aspect of that wrong. Hey, quick thing, uh, American Bar Association... Maybe stop having her be qualified to be an attorney. All of a sudden, not a judge in Florida. That's the rule there. Yeah. At this point, the ABA is like the UN of terrible judicial nominees, right? It's like, oh, no, not another strongly worded letter against the thing your entire institution was created to prevent. Yeah. No, they're more like the fucking League of Nations of (laughs) terrible judicial nominees. So, look. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a judge. I'm not even all the way caught up on opening arguments. So I'm not really qualified to opine on judicial rulings usually. But the arguments in this one are so blatantly absurd that it doesn't take much in the way of expertise to point out where she goes off the rails. Basically, the whole thrust of her main argument is that a 1944 statute that empowers the CDC to prevent the spread of disease uses the word sanitation, which in her dictionary means cleaning stuff. And... And wearing masks isn't cleaning stuff. (laughs) For real, that's the justification. Okay, so anti-vaxxers have to wear a giant vacuum tape to their face from now on. Got it. That's the new rule. (laughs) Hey, that's cool. You joke, Keith, but as the beardiest and by far the fattest guy on this show, if they offered to just spray me in the face with Lysol every four minutes instead of making me wear a mask for four hours on a plane, I would be so grateful. So (laughs) grateful. (laughs) You know what? You know what? Sanitation bleach, lady. Exactly. Now, let's set aside for a second the fact that that is not what sanitation means. Um, Even if she got the definition right, the word sanitation is in a list of other shit they're also allowed to do that ends with, quote, and other measures as in the Surgeon General's judgment may be necessary, end quote. I don't think she's qualified to be a judge in my and And, and not to get too far into the legal weeds here, but even if there was some ambiguity, and, and to be clear, there isn't, The courts are bound by a doctrine called Chevron deference, which basically says that if a statute is unclear on an agency's authorities, the courts are supposed to defer to the agency itself to interpret it. Right. So like saying the statute is ambiguous doesn't really get you there from a legal perspective. Instead, she has to argue that the statute very clearly meant to exclude measures like wearing masks. So, by my count, we're already wrong to the fourth power, but my list isn't exhaustive. If you want more on that, let me recommend episode 588 of the Opening Arguments podcast, where friend of the show Andrew Torres sets what I believe is a personal record for the most uses of, I wish I was making this up, in reference to a single judicial decision. (laughs) Okay, so she's saying that Congress intended to make a rule that's completely meaningless, and they're just hoping some genius conservative judge wouldn't look up the word sanitation, and then... 
uh, so, but pick a different definition to make obviously. a ruling against it? Yeah. Also, is she is she saying that if they propose the Lysol thing, that would be okay? <laughs> so, well, so, okay. So, to be clear, before this idiot waved her magic gavel, everyone in the country was required to wear masks on any form of public transportation or when in any public transportation hub. Now, it's up to each airline, airport, train station, etc. to make their own policies regarding masks. And if you saw how much fucking trouble they were having enforcing this shit when it had the rule of law behind it, you pretty much already know which policy they're going to favor. Hell, when this injunction went into effect and people saw it on their phones, airline passengers all over America started unmasking and hooting and (laughs) hollering about it then and there. Just looking around, oh, you guys have a Google alert for pestilent freedom too? Because I just (laughs) got masks off, right? We're all doing masks off? Hey, uh, Bill, since this literally just happened and there might be immunocompromised people on this flight, do you think we should, and you're swinging your mask around your head like a cow? Yeehaw! Okay. Yeah. Now, look- I get that a lot of people are actually super happy about this, right? Like, even a lot of people who are ostensibly on the side of following the science feel like the mask mandate has outlived its usefulness. Granted, a big reason for that is because selfish Trumpian douchebags refuse to follow the fucking rules. But regardless, there's not a lot of love for wearing masks for five or six hours at a stretch during a thing that was already unpleasant before you started masking up. That doesn't surprise me. But the way it was done... Right, by, by a 34-year-old partisan hack with a post hoc justification that William Lane Craig would be ashamed of is a far bigger threat to public health than actually doing it. Yes, there will be an appeal. Yes, the fucking appeal will almost certainly go the CDC's way. But the damage has already been done regardless. The wave of COVID this batshit judicial activism caused will already be underway by then, and it won't be anywhere near as virulent as Trump's effects on our judiciary. Yeah. And, and, can I add, because it happened this way, those of us who support science and may perhaps be fat and beardy don't get to celebrate for fear of looking like yeah. Trumpian assholes. I was promised public makeouts by a gum commercial, and I we've gotten none of that. <laughs> Every time something good happens, I have to be sad. It's the worst. Ugh. And speaking of new and unjustified risks to public health, it's time for a word from this week's first sponsor, Policy Genius. Hi, welcome to a typical house buying experience. Can I help you? Hi, yeah, um, I just finished the offer slash counter offer slash inspection process, and I would now do literally anything for this to be over. Um, is it? No. Nope. Is it over? Not even close. You're just getting started. I'm the provost of the initiate. Uh, once we go over the contract to deed, you're going to need a deed to contract. Okay. Uh, any chance that doesn't cost thousands of dollars? <laughs> of course it costs thousands of dollars. Of course Hello, does. I am the dean of contract deeds. I'll be signing off on your deed contract. That is, once you give me a thousand dollars. Right. Thousand dollars. Sorry, is anything about buying a home cheap and easy? Well, there's getting your home insurance with Policy Genius. Oh, what's uh, what's Policy Genius? How would he not know that? You work here. I, I know, but surprisingly, we have no idea about anything except our own jobs. It's true. Like Policy anything. Genius is your one-stop shop to find and buy the insurance you need. Ooh, really? How does it work? Click the link on the description or head to policygenius.com and answer a few questions. Policy Genius will show you the price estimates for policies that fit your search, and the Policy Genius team can look for ways to save you more money. And if you like what they find, they'll get you switched over for free. Customers who bundled their home and auto policies with Policy Genius saved an average of $1,250 per year over what they were paying. Plus, the Policy Genius team works for you without bias or favor to any one insurance company. Even after you're covered, Policy Genius offers claim support and easy reshopping to find savings when it's time to renew. Wow. And where do I sign up for this? Head to policygenius.com to get your free home insurance quotes and see how much you could save. All right. Well, I'm sold on that. So should we get started on the contract deed or what? No, dude, I'm the dean of the deed of contracts. I feel like you said something different. before. No, that's what he said. He said that. That's what I said. Is there any chance I died and went to hell? Good chance. We're back. Next up in headlines, in citation heated news, you may have heard that the Florida Department of Education rejected 54 of the 132 math textbooks publishers had submitted this year in accordance with state laws against wokeism. 
Yep. I, I'm not kidding, by the way. They literally called it the Stop Woke Act, for those of you who so haven't been paying sweet attention. Sweet acronym that they smushed in there so hard and badly. Yeah. So, pretty reasonably, quite a few people have been asking them to, if you'll forgive the pun, show their work. Not a pun. Nope. And this week, they released four examples from the books that they banned, and it makes the problem so much worse. <laughs> <That's> so silly. <laughs> so, uh, Governor DeSantis, quick thing while we're doing math. Here's a good math problem for you. If a state, let's say they're worried about the, uh, the education budget, and then they lose about, I don't know, $750 million a year in tax revenue when like a really big company decides to leave, like uh, like a Disney-sized company decides to leave that state, and then that company also leaves behind like a billion dollars in debt that ends up falling on the state, that's, um, that's a negative number at the end of the day, right, <laughs> if you add it all up? Yeah, there's a lot of ways DeSantis gains from Floridians knowing less math. I get it. Still, I feel like it'd be a lot cheaper for Disney to get rid of DeSantis than to leave. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. So you can access these examples along with the contact information of the officials who banned it on the Florida Department of Education website. But let's go over them for you right now. So the first two examples, I, I can actually understand. I, I don't agree, of course, but they're from a math problem about adding and subtracting polynomials, and it uses as its data set the results of the implicit bias test. <laughs> and look, if you just pass laws making it illegal to teach about racism, mathematical proof of how racist people are is a definite <laughs> no-no. Like, I, yeah. I get it. Such a great job by whoever wrote that math book. So right. Florida's not going <laughs> to use your book, whatever, but... Ron DeSantis had to explain out loud that a mathematical proof of racism is technically racist against white people, if you think about it. He had to, like, yeah. say that and do this. Oh, I, I love this tactic. Like, try to sneak one by them with a lesson about how red is for redlining or something like that. <laughs> just, exactly. Go textbooks. Okay, but the second two they listed are just fucking baffling. Okay, the third banned part of a book that they show is, I assume... A kindergarten level exercise about counting from one to five, though, honestly, it could be high school. It is Florida. But the social emo emotional learning objective of that exercise is to, quote, build proficiency with social awareness as they practice with empathizing with classmates, end quote. So that had to go. The part about empathy. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Again, yeah, to be clear, when you translate that back out of jargon, the goal is to teach kids to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> and that's literally against the goddamn law yep. in Florida. Uh, yes. And last, and perhaps most baffling of all, the final example has a word redacted. Mm -hmm. so, Interesting. So, so I assume it was butt fucking, but here's what it says about the redacted <laughs> word. Quote, this feature is designed to build student agency by focusing on students' social and emotional learning, end quote. So... Yeah, probably butt fucking, right? That yeah, sounds, like fucking. <laughs> sounds like Mickey Mouse grooming a child bride with polynomials, too. And like, we almost snuck it past them, but we they did. caught that. Uh, but we'll, we'll keep trying. Those clever bastards. So, yeah, this is all horrible, and I, I hate it. I, I hate the people doing it. I hate how normal it is. Like, I hate that all the people involved get to go to grocery stores and feel physically safe doing what they do and being what they are. But the good news, as Heath hinted earlier, is that these idiots just took away Disney's special tax code. So pretty sure they're all going to wake up with Goofy's head in their bed pretty soon and the uh, <laughs> problem's going to work itself out. <laughs> and next up in headlines, InfoWars filed for bankruptcy last week. Ooh, ooh. Aww. And, of course, any failure by an alt-right piece of shit conspiracy theorist like Alex Jones is delightful. The New York Times article, it was like VR porn in text format for me. <laughs> well, here's what makes this particular story even better. This wasn't just any failure. This was a brand whose entire product is lying. And they failed economically in America. Yeah. That's so hard. This is like Donald Trump going bankrupt as the literal house with a casino company. Yeah. But less ethical than that mm. by a lot. <laughs> less ethical than Donald Trump by a lot is what I just said. Infowars and two other companies connected to Alex Jones had to file for Chapter 11 protection in the face of multiple defamation lawsuits about the absurd lying. And again, it's great. Yeah, a, a man who once had to testify in a custody hearing that he was too full of shit for anyone to take seriously had a worse day. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the man literally had to convince a judge that he was a caricature of himself to be allowed to see his kids, and that was not his <laughs> low point. 
So just in case you haven't been following the tragic tale of Alex Jones, here's a little background. Alex Jones is a professional liar who made a conspiracy theory brand with his show InfoWars as the main vehicle. He's a super spreader for the virus called Stupid and Dangerous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This includes the claim, for example, that Hillary Clinton is running a cannibalistic pedophile ring in the basement of a pizza place, and the claim that the U.S. military put chemicals in the water supply in order to make an, an army of gay frogs, I think, and then mm -hmm. profit or something. That one was confusing to me. And also the claim that led to the defamation suits that the Sandy Hook Elementary School mass shooting was staged by the U.S. government in order to take away everyone's guns. And he claimed the victims' families were crisis actors who were part of that scam. Uh, also, he looks like uh, like a Rush Limbaugh-themed WWE wrestler called like the Podcaster. He's the worst. <laughs> I hate him so much. I resent that metaphor. Well, <laughs> well, the lying about Sandy Hook led to the incitement of very literal angry mobs, like real ones, that harassed the families of the shooting victims, often threatening violence, and forcing many of those people to leave their homes in fear. Some multiple times, different homes. And it turns out all of that, that inciting, is illegal. Even if you thought this was America, that's actually illegal. Well, I, well, to be clear, it was illegal eventually. It was slowly right? illegal, yes. That's true. <laughs> So th the basic pattern of the defamation suits was pretty great. It was fun to watch. The plaintiffs presented the very obvious lie by Alex Jones in InfoWars. And then the judge said, uh, okay, Mr. Jones, do you have any evidence to back up your claim? And then there was a very long pause in all of these court proceedings where Alex Jones tried to remain completely still and <laughs> then gavel. And during a preliminary hearing for one of those lawsuits in Connecticut last month, the judge actually did the I'm going to count to three thing with Alex Jones while he was yeah. you know, trying to remain still, basically, with Jones failing to respond to court orders and failing to appear for required testimony. In some cases, that judge ordered a fine of twenty five thousand dollars for every weekday that Jones refused to appear. Now, he did end up appearing again after paying seventy five thousand dollars for three weekdays of stalling. Now, Alex Jones claimed he had a cold, and that's why he was, he was a little sniffly, and he had to miss the court hearings. He could have done Zoom, I'm sure. Whatever. He'll get the money back if he complies with the court going forward. But his company still went bankrupt from all the other lawsuits, and this latest one in Connecticut is actually still going with his liability for that still up in the air. Yeah, well, and, and it's it's far from certain that he's even going to get away with the bankruptcy, right? Like the lawyers for the Sandy Hook families uh, are saying that it's a bullshit tactic to try to force those families into a settlement before the trial. And the Department of Justice's bankruptcy watchdog seems to be saying the same fucking thing. So as clear and as stark an admission of failure as bankruptcy is, he may still fail at it. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's declaring bankruptcy like Michael Scott and the government's just like, mm, no, we're going to watch how oh, this plays yeah. out. Mm. And, and absolutely, that's what he's doing. That's the correct strategy for an asshole to do is declare bankruptcy to try to get a settlement. That makes sense. And just in case anyone's curious about what argument Alex Jones is even trying to make in these lawsuits, here's what we learned during his meltdown rant outside the Connecticut courthouse earlier this month. And when I say meltdown rant, I mean Alex Jones talked. He has one setting. That's what yeah, he has. Yeah, I was going to so, say. So according to Jones, he's protected by the First Amendment. He's not. That's, that's not how it works. But he does con law at a first grade level. It's a free country. I like stochastic terrorism and juice. Like, that's where he's at in terms of that. <laughs> not um, juice boxes, but juice. Just yeah. Juice, yeah. On top of the nonsense free speech thing, he pointed out that the media was wrong about WMDs in Iraq back in the day. <laughs> Okay. Which is true. Okay. And also they were wrong about Jesse Smollett. Yeah. And they, they were for a second. Of course, those initial reports on those topics were based on something other than I'm not moving. You can't see me. They actually had a reason to do that. And then those media outlets immediately issued very clear retractions when they found out they were wrong because that's how info works. <laughs> yeah, to, to be clear, he's arguing that he read in the media that the media was wrong, so you can't trust the media. Yeah, but hey, Alex, you can totally start a defamation lawsuit against all the media outlets that say you faked your child's death. So yeah, get that money back, big dog. Just, yeah, yeah go, there you go. Go ahead. <laughs> and uh, just a quick note on the arguing technique that's happening here. If your version of alt-right Uncle Frank is anything like mine, you'll have to deal with this whataboutism thing that they do. 
he'll say something like, you know, squares are a Ponzi scheme. And then you have to be like, no, 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 that's dumb. And here's why. I will explain it to you. And then he'll say, okay, but what about the WMDs in Iraq? And in the heat of the argument, it's easy to go along with that ridiculous pivot for a second and forget where you were. But you got to stop and you got to explain, okay, okay. We can eventually move on to your next thing, which may or may not be also stupid. But first, squares are, in fact, real. I just explained (laughs) it. I need to hear you say that squares are real. And therefore, Hillary Clinton is not murder fucking a child right now. I need you to say that whole thing. So make them do that. Make them stop. Make them change their opinion based on the new thing. They probably won't. But make them hear all this happen. It's, It's like dealing with a cat who won't get into the carrier from like an argument perspective, you know, the cat clings to the side and, and then you get them to let go with those paws, but then they immediately grab a new spot real fast somehow. <laughs> and you have to make them admit that the last spot was wrong before you moved on just conceptually for you. And either way, we're putting them in a cage and they're eventually getting vaccinated. That's the bottom line. <laughs> it's a lot like that. Yeah, no, they're like pissy felines, except it's harder to get them to take their medicine. Spot on. <laughs> yeah. And they smell worse. Well, yep. yeah, right, because because cats clean themselves. Good call. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm picturing Alex Jones trying to clean himself. So <laughs> <laughs> the part where he licks his chest, you know, that's, that's always the funniest looking. Bow. Bow. Just one leg straight up in the air. Bow. <laughs> exactly. Wow. I'll eat your ass. Wow. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you're, the sentence you're pivoting into is the Sandy Hook yeah, shooting. I want to talk. I want to pivot to. I want to pivot to the Sandy Hook shooting. Back to that. So, it's serious. Obviously, just wow. again, no, for real serious. That was a very real tragedy, of course, and it didn't involve fucking crisis actors. But even if that whole conspiracy theory was true about the crisis actors. The government should be trying to take away your guns still, (laughs) right? Like Mm -hmm. fake real massacres aren't the move, but we should take away your fucking guns. Side note, as I was reading about this, I literally I'm do I'm reading about this exact story. And I saw another headline pop up about a Georgia prosecutor who shot himself in the leg inside a courthouse this week because he was carrying a metal death machine and he's a fucking idiot. And he tried to show it to somebody and it fired and he hit himself in the leg. <laughs> and it is 100% legal for him to be carrying that inside the courthouse in Georgia. Jesus. But, okay, let's circle back to the, the good news. We had some good news at the beginning of this. Infowars went bankrupt and I'm very happy. And again, their product is just lying. It's, it's not like they had a supply chain problem because of COVID or like rising production costs due to inflation. It's just that Alex Jones is a geometric cylinder of stupid failure who's trying to lick himself with his <laughs> legs straight up in the air. <laughs> Asshole. All right. On that note, I think we're taking a quick break for a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Any second. Oh, boy. Any second now. Hey, hey, Eli. What, what you doing? Oh, hey, Noah. I was just waiting for my stress to magically go away. I'm pretty sure it's going to be like next week is when it'll be gone. Okay, why do you think that? You know, it just will. Next week. Mm, mm-hmm. Have you considered talking to a therapist about it? Therapy for stress? <laughs> People don't go to therapy for stress, do they? Actually, they do. Therapists can be a great way to talk through the stress in your life and to learn some techniques to help make life less stressful. I don't know, Noah. Going to a place with things, my feet. Well, why not try BetterHelp? Oh, what's BetterHelp? Come on, Heath! What? I was checking to see if the stress was better. No, Well, it's not. It's not better because you stole See? The- now I know. So, good. Made it worse. Well, then listen to Noah. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy. Give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. Plus, Skeptocrat listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Skeptocrat. Nice. So how much of your stress would you say is related to Heath stealing your points in the ass? Oh, like a lot. I see. Good. Good. Happy about that. And we're back. Next up in headlines in whole new ballgame news. Fantastic. Thank you. Clearly, Tucker Carlson was feeling a bit slighted by the fact that Heath hasn't done a tuck your face segment in a while. 
because he auditioned hard for inclusion on the show last Friday <laughs> when he released a trailer for his upcoming documentary, The End of Men, which, A, would not have been more homoerotic if it was advertising a gay porn, and B, <laughs> seems to endorse the idea of increasing one's testosterone level by tanning one's testicles. And, and and while I'm certainly even more enthusiastic about Tucker Carlson's viewers irradiating their balls than he is, <laughs> I still feel like I'm duty-bound to point out that it's pseudoscientific nonsense that is not recommended by medical professionals. Or is it, Noah? Or is it? I bet those cowards won't even do it. Not manly enough. <laughs> Typical snowflake Republicans don't have the balls to tan their balls. Just they won't do it. Balls they is won't. It is. is it weird that when I saw this, my first thought was, oh, Oh, where was this going to best slot into GAM and not, <laughs> oh, a dangerous <laughs> idiot is spreading misinformation. <laughs> no, same. Me too. Not weird. Not weird. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Same thought. So yeah, the, the trailer is for an upcoming episode of his series, Tucker Carlson Presents, called The End of Men, wherein presumably viewers will be warned about the loss of traditional manhood by a guy who used to have a signature bow tie until Jon Stewart outwitted him so hard that CNN fired his ass. Yeah, that did happen. And happen. it seems to be based on the idea that was a cliche in the days of fucking Herodotus of Halicarnassus, wherein soft times make soft men, make hard times make hard men. Uh, and speaking of hard men, uh, pretty much every <laughs> second of the preview that isn't devoted to paraphrasing that nonsense or body shaming overweight guys is filled with mostly naked men doing sweaty stuff like shirtless wrestling shirtless wood chopping and shirtless cow milking i did not make that last one up watch the fucking preview i i like that in the republican fantasy of masculinity they do the work of a medieval surf right, right? it's like oh you're, you're chopping wood and you're mining coal do you guys want to give me prima nocta <laughs> while you're at it just really show me how fucking manly you are give you prima nocta i don't understand what that means <laughs> Uh, but, of course, the, the shot in the preview that's garnering the lion's share of the Internet's interest is a shot where you see a fully naked dude more or less fucking a dick-sized tanning bed. Mm -hmm. It's more than less, uh, I would say. <laughs> so, uh, apparently, this is called red light therapy, wherein people are encouraged to bathe their balls in infrared light to alternately increase their vitamin D count, cure their erectile dysfunction, or increase their testosterone. Uh, like... Pretty much every alternative therapy and pretty much no legitimate one, the benefits of this procedure shift over time. Uh, suffice to say, there's no scientific evidence on red light therapy's effectiveness, but what evidence we do have about exposing your nuts to infrared light suggests it would do the exact damn opposite of what Tucker's promoting it for. <laughs> yeah. Also, if your audience base's dicks work so badly that you dedicate an entire documentary to the cure... Maybe don't also make that documentary about your supposed virility and manliness. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but either way, we just got a new market angle for the infrared fleshlight shaped like Ted Cruz's mouth. So that's cool, right? Yeah, I mean, no, that's, that's good. That's good and also, bad. Also, evolutionarily, aren't the testicles external like that so that it's a little bit lower than body temperature that's better yep. you, you want to yep. keep it a little bit lower than normal oh, yeah, body temperature? yeah yeah no if anything <laughs> for sperm production it's not a good thing for your balls jesus uh, by, by the way the preview also includes this doctor or you know dude in a white lab coat anyway i don't fucking know scaremongering about the fact that sperm counts have gone down over the last 40 years or so and to give you a hint what we're dealing with there when i googled that claim the first three items that came up were in order an article from the New York Times called The Sperm Count Crisis Doesn't Add Up. An article from the Harvard Gazette titled Fears Over Falling Sperm Counts May Be Overblown. And an article from USA Today called Falling Sperm Counts Threaten Humanity. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, those Harvard New York Times nerds are just fucking part of it. Although I, I would do want to give a shout out to Harvard for overblown great use. Of, yeah, yep, well done. Great word choice there. <laughs> um, so this claim actually comes from a 2017 meta-analysis with iffy methodology and incomplete data. And let's face it, there's been no corresponding drop in birth rates over those years. Huh. So it's probably wrong. And even if it's right, it's meaningless. Uh, unless, of course, you can terrify your viewers with it, in which case it's worth its weight in gold. <laughs> and in MTG, I don't remember news. It turns out that trying to overthrow the United States government is illegal. And I'm not eventually. just saying. Yeah, <laughs> eventually. <laughs> and, and I'm not.
not just saying that because we had a company meeting in the commercial break, which to be fair, we did. No, yeah. I'm saying that because last week, Marjorie Taylor Greene testified at a hearing on whether she's disqualified from seeking re-election because she's a literal treasonous traitor. And it was so farcical. And Ron's lawyers would have been like, come on, what the fuck are we doing here, guys? <laughs> let's, uh, yeah. let's wrap this right, up. To- to, to be clear, this is a challenge to her candidacy through Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, right? So the bad guys in the Civil War and Marjorie <laughs> Taylor Greene. That's who that section was mm-hmm. for. They have a lot in common, actually. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. So the testimony was actually pretty boring. It was mostly MTG not remembering things she very obviously said and did with little odds and ends of sass tossed in here and there. Like, listen to this sassy as fuck quote from CNN. Quote, She didn't remember if she'd ever spoken with any GOP lawmakers or White House officials about the potential for violence on January 6th. She also said she couldn't recall if she herself had posted a handful of tweets that appeared on her account, where she claimed the 2020 election was illegitimate. And she said she didn't remember saying that she opposed the peaceful transfer of power to Joe Biden right before lawyers for the challengers played a video of her saying that. (laughs) Let's remind you. Fantastic. Yeah, that's pretty damning. But honestly, if it turns out Marjorie Taylor Greene does not have object permanence as a human being that actually tracks like her political career is a lot like you know a racist baby playing peekaboo like it makes a lot of sense in some way well well, plus we have no idea what those space lasers can do to your memories (laughs) (laughs) exactly okay but i want to be clear here don't let the fact that a fucking course she did fool you into thinking that this hearing is a sure thing the burden of proof will be on the challengers to show by a quote more likely than not standard that january 6th was legally an insurrection and that green helped the insurrectionists and they've got to prove that without hitting any of trump's appointed idiot judges like the ghosts and pac-man so i'm not holding out hopes for consequences or justice or any kind of reform no Sorry, I think we need another team meeting. You guys are sure we can't overthrow (laughs) this government. This one, the one we have now. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Okay. And finally tonight, in Deuce Canoes, (laughs) Fox News correspondent Peter Deucey got horribly beaten in yet another verbal sparring match with White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. And it's the greatest. These are all the greatest. If you haven't been following this ongoing feud you're really missing out because Pisaki wins every single time. It's just a matter of how and what it looks like. But this week, Ducey was certain he had a winner. He thought he had it. He did not. He did not have a winner. He never has a winner. He asked about the difference between a mask mandate on airplanes that we used to have and the lack of a strict mask mandate inside the White House. And Pisaki went into you know, patronizing kindergarten teacher mode that she reserves just for Peter Ducey. And she explained very slowly the difference between green zones, red zones, and yellow zones, and how those are different what, Peter? Colors. Exactly. Those are different colors. (laughs) And they represent different levels of what? Risk. Yes, exactly. So she explained how that works. You know how hundreds of thousands of Americans travel through the White House every day to get to like vital doctor's appointments and the funerals of their loved ones? No? Cool. <laughs> Stop asking questions. Stop. Yes. I, mean, I, you know, I was disappointed, honestly. I, like, I've been waiting for Pisaki's response to a Fox News reporter to include the phrase, here comes the airplane into the hangar. <laughs> and this was the moment. Yep, she right? was there. Yeah. Yeah. Right, she could have made noises and did a little airplane with her hand. <laughs> That's the new Ryan Gosling refusing cereal. Peter Ducey <laughs> refusing baby food from Jen Psaki in a spoon with the airplane noise. I like it. So here's the normal pattern with Peter Ducey. He asks some kind of nonsense leading question with like 19 rejectable premises. And then Jen Psaki stares at him for a few seconds to make it really awkward for him. And then she's like, no, like the questions are never yes or no questions. But her answer of essentially just no is the most accurate and intellectually honest answer almost every time. Yeah. Sometimes Pisaki adds a little flair to it and just answers a different question that could actually have a real answer. And in one exchange last year, this is one of my favorites, she said, hey, uh, Peter, before I answer that question, those are some really nice colorful socks you got there, man. And he got distracted and she just moved on. It was perfect. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. And here's the exact exchange with Ducey this week. He asked, if you think we need a mask on a plane... Why don't you all wear a mask in the White House? Okay, so obviously 
Jen Psaki could have explained the difference between a tiny metal tube full of random travelers like Eli just described and one of the most secure buildings in the world that has plenty of space and a staff that's all vaccinated. Instead, she, she explained that color system. But first, before she did that, she said, well, Peter, I'm not a doctor and you're not a doctor that I'm aware of. If you're a doctor, I wasn't aware of that until today. Are you a doctor? And after a long pause, Ducey angrily mumbled, he's like, I'm not, no, 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 doctor. no doctor. <laughs> and Pisaki's like, okay, got it. Not a doctor. Cool. I'm just gonna write that down. Not a doctor, Peter. Dude. Like almost exact words. She didn't do the, like the writing thing, but almost exact words. And then she explained how three colors work to him. Oh, what a brilliant fucking story. She's like, okay, you know what? I'm going to deal with your stupid fucking question here, but not before I get you to admit that you're looking for a zinger, not an answer. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> Jen needs to keep this streak alive, right? Like next week when he asks something, she'll just be like, now I'm not a mouthpiece for the dying fascist wing of my government. Peter, are you a mouthpiece for the dying <laughs> fascist wing of our government? Mm, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it was already a fun moment. But right after Ducey said, like, I'm not, I'm not a doctor in a snit like that, that's when another reporter right next to him was like, or do you play one on TV? And OK, that's funny kind of by itself. But that's actually an amazing callback to a moment last week when Pisaki did a live appearance on Pod Save America when they asked her, is Peter Ducey, uh, would you say, a stupid son of a bitch or does he just play one on TV? And she actually answered Okay, she tried to answer nicely, but then she just pivoted right to, like, kind of honest. <laughs> she said, well, he works for a network that provides him with questions that might make anyone sound like a stupid son of a bitch on TV, which which was her really nice way of saying, yes, he's intelligent enough to know that he's fucking evil, but not by a lot. It's not, it's not like he's a doctor level intelligence, <laughs> but he knows what he's doing. I don't know. I, I think we need more meta moments in the hellscape we currently live in, right? It's not going to change anything and it doesn't matter. So like, what if next week Peter Ducey's just like, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> now you say something mean so I can show it to grandpas whose dementia is appearing as racism. Go. Yeah. Also, could you steeple your fingers a bit as you say it? <laughs> Stroke a cat angrily. Yeah, so Fox News is an absolute poison to all of society. But occasionally you get to watch one of these moments with Peter Ducey getting eviscerated by Jen Psaki. It, it's like the guy who thinks he knows, you know, Qigong energy kung fu and he runs up to a real fighter and he does a really long kata and then he's like, what now? And then Jen Psaki just punches him in the fucking face and he runs away crying and yelling like, time out, too hard, too hard. It's great to watch this happen to Peter Ducey every time. So Here's what I'm hoping for going forward. If anybody knows Jen Psaki, please tell her about all the amazing number of Heath points that are available here. I want an escalating series of pranks. And just start small. I want to see Peter Ducey assigned to a tiny little chair for five-year-old at the next <laughs> briefing and everybody else has full-size chairs. And, and he, he can get a big boy chair if he answers a few basic science questions out loud. And then ramp it up from there. But just show me that there first little piece. <laughs> Be so happy. All right, on that note, we are going to close it out. Thanks to No Illusions, thanks to Eli Bosnick, and thanks to all the listeners who liked us on Facebook, followed us on Twitter, and sent us feedback on the other various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening, and please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, please feel free to send us gifts of money at our donation page at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like all our new generous donors who will be genitalially complimented next time around. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people. If you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed, available on Apple Music, Stitcher, all those other podcast apps, or the deep web. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Rai Slonik of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check them out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today. Were he is the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you. He is the creator of the virtuosic. I got it. Almost there too.
He's the creator of the Virtuosic... I got to shit, you guys. <laughs> I'll talk to you guys later. I'm so sorry. He is the creator of the Virtuosic <laughs> musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check them out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign-off. I'm going to shit my pants. That's our catchphrase sign-off this week. Perfect. The preceding podcast is a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022.